So when we talk about amazing experiences, I meet people that do things all the time. And I'm just like, you do what? Wow. And they go, what? You were Mick Jagger's bad bodyguard? I'm like, yeah, but it's like sort of the same reactions we had. So I had the same reaction to him as he had to me. But to the outside, it just looks different. So like I said, it's all relative. But I think in the end, I have interest in every person who sits in front of me, beside me, or behind me. And I literally talk to everybody. I'm on a plane. That's the guy. I'm the guy next to you who's going to say, hey, where are you from? You know? And I just start. And obviously, I'll respect you if you say, look, dude, I want to listen to my, my music or whatever. Then, okay, grateful data. It is. So um, I, think it's, I think it's interest in other people is number one. And number two is... Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today we have something a little different. I'm really excited to have, well, first of all, you can see my background's a little different. In an effort to constantly improve sound, I've now moved into what I'm calling the control room because this sounds a little deader, a little less uh, echoey and uh, I don't know. But anyway, we have Stephen Kuhn here today who is one of the more interesting people I've met in the last little while. Uh, Steve is a trainer and a consultant for some of the world's top CEOs. Uh, he came onto my radar when he was brought to Affiliate World Europe um, because of his amazing success with Laybag and Trustbag, these two internet bonanzas, you know, as a performance marketer that, um, you know, he was the driving force behind the sales of over 1 million euros uh, in sales on Laybag and Trustbag in, in less than one week. And he's also just had such an, a very, very interesting life, a very, very interesting career. Um, he has a very great sort of uh, performance philosophy and, and sort of life philosophy that I'm eager to get into. We're going to start by talking about some of the things that he brought to the table at Facebook Mastery Live, which was uh, a, a great speech that he did for us there. And I think it's going to go off the rails shortly after that into all sorts of interesting topics. So let's just jump right in. Stephen, welcome to the Robust Marketer. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's an honor to be here. Nice. I've heard so much about these. I, 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 I sort of tuned in uh, once I got to know you guys. It's really exciting. There's so many different uh, aspects of the business. And even, you know, when, when I say I like to lead businesses, it's always good to, to get a new, a new insight because let's face it, this industry is new to me. Yeah. So it's very exciting. So talk about that a little bit. What was your entry into the world of performance marketing? Uh, well, you know, I tried it myself. I had a few eBooks back uh, when I was an executive, and um, you know, just never really hit it. Uh, you know, sales funnels, and you had some guy do it for you, and it wasn't the right guy. It never is, seems to be. And um, and then um, I have friends that uh, came up with the idea for Laybag, and they said, Stephen, we need you to take care of this and make sure it's global. And I said, sure. Never done it before, but I'm pretty sure I can. And uh, we did. <laughs> To make a long story short, we went global, and uh, in, a, in a matter of weeks, actually, we went global, and it was all due to sort of homemade videos and that uh, that attack, that intuitional sort of feeling. What's next? How do we react to to the market uh, reaction to our our ads? For instance, you have ads, and people make comments. You react to those comments with another video. You react to those comments with another video. So you're telling a story the whole time that the customers dictate. So it was quite exciting, and it was something I just came up with because I said, "Why should I answer them? Just give them another video." And it it, it really it really went nuts. That's super interesting. And and so, what do you attribute the success to? The overall success is it a mix of it being a great product that people really love, and and the strategy, and and then within the strategy, what do you really isolate as the big reason for the success of of Laybag in particular? I I would have to say a small team. Agile, we made decisions in seconds and had them implemented in minutes and was online in an hour, um, number one. Number two is we, because we're such a small company, we, we could allow ourselves to do things that, let's say, larger companies not only could not do, but a large company is like a, like a tanker. It takes a long time to turn. We're a speedboat. You know, we can do basically anything we want. And, of course, the mar you know, let's face it, the laybag was a pretty amazing invention. Um, you know, and... You know, there was other types of those bags out there, not necessarily with parachute, but these kind of chairs you throw around. And they never really made it um, uh, because the marketing was wrong. They tried traditional marketing. They used large agencies with big budgets and they used traditional channels. And, you know, we just decided, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very simple. I have two principles in my business. Spend as little as possible to make as much as money, much money as possible. And it sounds simple. But most people forget that. They go, well, I need an agency for the video. I need someone to edit, edit it. Oh, I need someone to do my texting for me as well. Oh, and we need someone to take the photos for the still photo. No, do it yourself. Do it yourself. And one thing that performance marketing teaches is it's not always the highest quality, polished 
image or, or video that gets the job done. And this is something you found with what you were doing. You were, you were filming things on your iPhone. Right. Well, it's because we're in your living room then, aren't we? It's like you looking into your phone and seeing me looking out. It's, it's different than if it's a high quality, polished, you know, great pool ways and oh, wonderful. I mean, we did videos like that and they were nice, <laughs> but they were expensive. And we decided to literally after two weeks, we said, no, 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 no. They actually flew to like, uh, we went to Mallorca, they went to London, went to, to film on location to make sure that we have the real, um, uh, you know, the real location, the real backgrounds and stuff. It was great for, for a video that we could show our kids, I guess. But it's spending do- a lot of money. Yeah, and it didn't do anything for the business. Really didn't. That's super interesting. And and back to your point earlier about the conversations that you have with customers. Um, this is something that I experienced as well. I was user acquisition director for a, for a funded gaming company, and we were able to get our cost of acquisition down very, very low. And a lot of it was by using these posts that we had these big conversations on, because it's not just a conversation you're having with one customer, especially on Facebook. It's the full story. And people, when they're looking at your product, are going to look through that that whole thing. So you were even upping it, upping the ante by not just responding in text, but by responding with custom video. That's a really cool idea. It, well, you know, because what, what I notice is when, and even when I, you know, logged in, I bought something on Kickstarter or whatever, I would put a comment, well, hey, this doesn't work. And all they do is they post a comment like, thank you for your reply. You can order your product here. Like, that's not a reply. They just basically answer everything. So you get that pop up. You know, they answered your message. They answered your message. And most people won't even read it. So if I, if you go, just go online now, anyone, and look at the products and look at their posts, and you hardly ever see a true answer addressing the question. It's always a general sort of, you know, and, and my opinion was, in, especially in the beginning, okay, in the end, when you have thousands and thousands of customers, it's really difficult. In the end, we had, I think, 15 uh, full-time Facebookers, you know, and uh, um, if you look at it, you'll see that, that creating that wave of, of, of good, oh, thank you for the comment, oh, the video is awesome, creating that in the beginning, because you said people read the comments, they'll either read the first couple or the last couple. Mm-hmm. So we got to make sure they're always good. It's an ember, right? You have, you have a, and that's what I like your, your comment about maybe not, that doesn't work at massive, massive scale at the, at the very end, although I'm sure some attention to the comments is always worth it. But just what really matters is getting the ember going with your audience and, and with the comments on those. Right. And, you know, we had, we had some trouble with the trust bag. I'm not going to lie to that. We had um, some uh, manufacturing issues with the, the eyelets at the bottom pulling out. And we addressed that by basically either returning the money or re- 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 uh switching out the bags and sending them a new bag, not even taking the old one back. They could keep it and yeah. uh, just a new bag. We tried to do that, but I have to say the, um, the quality issues were too much, were too much to deal with. So we stopped production and we have a new one coming out, mm. even better, even nicer, even better. Very, very nice. Coming out very soon. Now <laughs> you, yeah, good. Always be plugging. We'll, we'll do some plugs for Facebook mastery live later. Um, but, uh, this experience you had with Laybag and Trustbag, it's, you know, a lot of people that would be, okay, that's, that's the, the career. That's the, that's the thing I'm based on. That's the thing that I do. Uh, and, and, you know, talking to you for five minutes uh, in Berlin there, I realize it's just a, it's, first of all, it's par for the course for you to have kind of results like this. And it's just a drop in the bucket when it comes to all the other amazing experiences that you've had in life. Um, what, what is it about your philosophy as a person that you think puts you in, in such an amazing position to, to work in all these amazing areas? You know, I get asked that a lot, actually, and the word amazing comes up a lot, but let's say, first of all, if I start by saying, for me, it's amazing. It, it's, I mean, I'm truly, truly blessed, but it's all relative because you know, I, I was in the Iraq war, and, um, and people tell me, I, I met the Vietnam veterans, and they're like, look, man, you, know, you don't know what war is. I was in Vietnam for two years. And I said, you know, thank you for your service. I'm very sorry, but that was my Vietnam. <laughs> I, I can't even imagine it to be worse or different or other. That's that's the most intense thing I've ever had. So when we talk about amazing experiences, I meet people that do things all the time. And I'm just like, you do what? Wow. And they go, what? You were Mick Jagger's bad bodyguard? I'm like, yeah, but it's like sort of the same reactions we had. So I had the same reaction to him as he had to me, but to the outside, it just looks different. So like I said, it's all relative. But I think in the end, I have interest in every person who sits in front of me, beside me or behind me. And I literally talk to everybody. I'm on a plane. That's the guy. I'm the guy next to you who's going to say, "Hey, where are you from?" You know, and I just start. And obviously, I'll respect you if you say, "Look, dude, I want to listen to my my music or whatever." Then, okay, grateful day. To, it is. So, um, I think it's I think it's interest in other people is number one. And number two is I have a true passion to help others. And I can't really say where it comes from, uh, but I had an experience 
um, that cleared it up to me. It wasn't even too long ago. Um, I was in boot camp in 1986, uh, U.S. Army in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I had a guy connect to me on Facebook about, I don't know, maybe six, eight months ago, and he says, Steve, you're the most fearless person I ever met. And I went, okay, thanks for that. I haven't seen you in 30 years, but thank you. And, uh, Quite the impression. Told, yeah, and I was like, wow, first impressions, you know. So I said, okay, why did you say that? And he told me a story about how uh, he was in a fight on a maneuver in a dark field, and I heard him calling, and I came over, and I pulled two guys off of him. And I said to myself, okay, not a big deal. But then I wondered, and I, and I asked myself, I said, why would I do that? So was it to be cool? No, because I don't. it wasn't to be cool. Was it just to help a friend? Maybe, you know. Was it because I'm a tough guy? No, it was because it was the right thing to do. And, you know, I didn't hesitate to do that right thing. And I think that came from my childhood somewhere. You know, maybe it was uh, my upbringing, probably part of my upbringing, and, and other things that I, people that I, uh, I, I had as mentors. Um, many, funny enough, in America, many foreigners uh, uh, that you know, worked for foreigners almost all the time, Italians and, you know, all that kind of stuff. My, my uh, stepdad was a Canadian. Um, so and he was a bus driver for a Christian, I forget the name of it, a Christian uh, group in um, – in Canada, a Christian singer, a gospel group. Anyway, okay. Um, so I, th I think it was part of that. But in, let's basically, if we break it down, it's, it's true interest in other people, true interest to to help people, and just in general, um, loving to see people happy and uh, successful. And I, I will do pro bono. I've done pro bono. I don't like doing it, but I usually, I'll, if, if I'm in a city doing something and I see someone who needs some help and they can't really, you know, get there, I'll say, okay, I'll help you out. If you get something happens, then we'll talk about it. Yeah. But so I, I love to see people succeed and it fuels me to see people succeed. It sounds cheesy. It sounds okay. This guy's altruistic. He's goofy. But I tell you this, uh, if, if anybody calls me and says, Stephen, we need this, this, that, or that, I guarantee you, I know somebody or I can get, it. I know, it. I yeah. just know it. Because that's how, that's, that's how I live. So, so the thing you left out there, and it was sort of what you spoke about at Facebook Mastery Live, was this idea of intuition. And and so when, when you hear someone calling over there, and you know you can do that, and you know by your intern, you know, you're talking about your friend's uh, situation with being attacked at night and, and you pulling a couple guys off of him, it's, it's that sort of trust in your gut in a way that that was the right thing to do. And that's something that I kind of get from you is that you're someone that has, you're like a... You're, this is going to sound bad. You're like a reverse Forrest Gump. You're because you're not you're not just a flower blowing in the wind, and you're not just bumbling into things like maybe Forrest was. But from the sounds of it, you've thrown yourself into all sorts of really interesting situations in a bit more active of a way than I think Forrest did. Uh, and and I, I find that really and I think that has something to do with your ability to really follow your gut. Would you Would you agree? Completely. And and it, and it's it's you you said the perfect word. Throw myself into it. I actually see it. If there's something that I don't know, I specifically want to do that. And if it's a challenge that someone says, can you do this? And I've never done it. I go, heck yeah, I can do it. And it's because I know that I can do it. And there's a thing that I, there's a saying that I have and it says, what's true belief? You know, true belief. People think, yeah, if I practice and I, you know, yeah, and I can believe in it and I see it and I vision and manifestation and all that kind of stuff. For me, belief is the lack of all doubt. Okay. Yeah. And that's how I live. So when I take something on, it's all pure intuition. I consciously look, okay, I can do that. I know I can. I've never done it, but I know I can. All right, and I'll let my intuition take over. And that's how I did layback. That's how I did trust bag with these guys. And I just let my intuition take over and I listen to it, you know? So yeah. it's, it's very, it's very uh, important for me to train that intuition. It's down here. And intuition is funny because, you know, everyone, everyone gets it and then it goes to a thought. So within a second, what I do, sometimes if it gets to my head, I just push it back down again. Okay, what, what was that feeling I had? Yes or no, maybe. Okay, we'll do it. So yeah, it's, it's basically everything I do is intuition. And this idea of being nimble is something that's been throughout your career, even though you started as a tank driver, which is the, which is the opposite of, of nimble, yeah. as you say. But uh, that's something that affiliates can really learn from as well. And it's something that it's the reason that, it, that, that that's why I think there's such a, a good affinity with, with your talk and your sort of subject matter with, with our audience is that um, being an affiliate marketer, being a performance marketer is very much about being able to be nimble and to be able to jump on things and prove out concepts and uh, and so that's why I think there's such a good fit there. Well, yeah, I, you know, I, I think nimble is a good word. Um, I think there's two things that you got to do is you got to react and you have to act. So while you're reacting to the market needs, you have to act and, and be one step ahead maybe. Um, it's just something that we, uh, that I, uh, I guess I learned out of, probably out of need when I was younger. Uh, it's, we didn't grow up very well to do. My mother was married quite a few times and then we had, Moved around a lot, and where'd you so go? I was, 
What's that? Where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in uh, Pennsylvania area, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, the whole, we moved around so much. It was all that central Pennsylvania area. Okay. And it was in Toronto quite often and, and Bancroft went fishing all the time and stuff um, with stepdad number two. And, uh, and so I was always looking for that, I guess, way out, I guess you could say, to be on my own, to try to get away from that sort of, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, classic American nightmare or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> American dream, isn't it? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It is now, you know, now that back then it wasn't very dreamy, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, and, and so, and for you, that first out was maybe not the first out, but, but your big out of that situation was the military. Yeah, it was huge. Is that right? So explain. So what 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 brought you there? And then talk a little, just a little bit about your military journey. I, I find it really interesting. Sure. Well, you know, I always wanted to go to the military, and it's funny because intuition again. I I, I trained to go to the Navy, so I went to the pre classes and everything, and I went to the Navy recruiter after a year of training uh, with the Navy recruiter to sign up finally because I was old enough, and my mom signed the paperwork. And I was sitting there, and he made, he made me wait. And there was this guy kept walking by in this like blue uniform, was beautiful. And he goes, what are you doing, son? I said, well, I'm just waiting for the Navy guy. Why don't you come to the Army? I said, no, no, I'm good. I'm going to the Navy. And this guy let me sit there for an hour. And he kept walking by. And finally he said, are you done waiting? I said, yeah, let's go. And he went and I signed up for the Army. <laughs> so that was my decision, signing up for the Army. And then I went into tanks and I got to Fort Knox. And I realized, and this might sound strange, but I could reset who I was. You know, the person that I was in high school and, you know, I yeah. not always liked yourself and maybe weren't the most popular. Everyone knew you, but it wasn't because you were popular. It's because you were a knucklehead. And, um, you know, I, I could reset myself. So I, I consciously reset who I was and said, I'm going to be more compassionate. I'm going to be more caring. I'm going to be outward. I'm going to be a go getter. And I'm not going to let anything get me down. And I practiced that in boot camp. And it's easy to do because you have no choice. Either you fall and die or you succeed. I mean, there's really no choice. At least there wasn't. Um, so that proved a lot to me. And then, then, then I went to Germany directly. And I landed in Germany, and I was the youngest, lowest-ranking guy in a company of 60 people. Now, you talk about a tough, a tough time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think I'm still friends with most of those guys today. And I learned – that's where I learned to embrace those around you and that everyone can teach you something. Everyone. Nice. And, yeah, so I sort of grew up from there. In the military, you know, then I went to the Gulf War. Uh, the first Gulf War. First Gulf War, and that's where I realized I wasn't as much as a hero as I thought I was. Uh, that was another, uh, um, yeah, that was another um, defining uh, time in my in my in my life period where in my life where I, at times when the war actually broke out, and I was in the very front uh, with the Third uh, Armored Division, Eighth Cavalry, it was it was difficult for me to stand up and run, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I, as I I did it, but I hesitated like you know a second, and a second in war is long i mean the second is the difference between life and death yeah and when i did get rolling it would turn into a movie into my head and you sort of block out reality and you just sort of watch it and you sort of make and you sort of roll and you go with it and stuff and then and then my friend got hit and i you know he was with me when he passed now that, that was my moment where i said you know um i said i thought something to myself in that moment and, and it was shameful uh, what i thought to me it was shameful and that defined me as well. Again, I said, you know, I, I, I got to be more selfless to be, to grow. I have to grow, and I, to, to grow, I need to be more selfless. And that was another defining moment where I then moved on, and I decided my time in the military was over. So six months later, I got found a way to get out. There's always ways, and most people don't know it, but I found a way to get out, and I decided to stay in Europe. Now, the problem with getting out of the military in Europe is your whole identity is, oh, there's an army guy. Mm. You know? So what do you do? Bodyguard, right? Doorman, that kind of stuff. So that's what I started doing. And then it developed from there. I got into the clubs. Then I did discos and clubs and bars and cocktail bars and then fitness clubs. And, you know, you just... Making the contacts way. all the way. Oh, of course. Well, look, this is the deal. People ask me, where did you meet all these people? In a bar, you meet everybody. And it's my comfort zone, not yours, right? Yeah. So everybody's everybody gets too drunk one time. So either it's the mayor or the police chief. Or so you get to know everybody, right? And then you're in the gym, and they're all sweaty and in, in, in jogging pants and stuff. They're not the guy in the suit and tie who's in their comfort zone. So, again, I'm in my comfort zone. So I basically met all those people in the times where they were sweaty or drunk. So That's <laughs> interesting. Know, I like that. Wow. So it's, it's just it's, 
that's how I met a lot of people all over the world. I mean, we had 87 clubs in Europe. I did clubs in America. We did Valley Table Fitness. We did a joint venture with them. Um, you know, I was executive um, as a director of Europe for operations and development. We had, I mean, we just, it was crazy. And the whole time I'm setting up businesses, mm -hmm. the whole time, setting up businesses, training people, doing marketing, uh, um, you know, sales funnels, uh, like true sales funnels uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s. Sorry, early 90s, um, we still wrote everything. There wasn't cell phones and computers yet that mm -hmm. were really available. So, you know, I, I learned the old school of sales. And honestly, I apply that now still. I just use it, I just do it on the computer. Yeah, I've, I've heard that's definitely, you mean direct mail, essentially? Um, well, not direct mail, just the way of communication. Mm. The way of communicating with someone was always direct. It was always direct. Hey, come here, let me talk to you, let's, let's, let's do this. Yep. And that's how I talk to people. And that's how I talk to clients. That's how I talk to B2B. If it's Walmart buyer or whoever said, so look, let's, let's not, you know, do this. Let's talk straight, you know? And that's, that's something that, that I like to, I like to, uh, you know, I always tell everybody, I think like a 12 year old, you know, I, I, I literally one, two, three, top, bottom, side, side. That's how I think. I, I, I don't try, I try not to complicate it. Now, I, but I, I, sorry, I actually had a discussion yesterday with a guy in, in Canada, a business, and, and I told him these simple steps. And he said, yeah, you know, you're right. I, I look in the book too much. I look at the rules too much. And I look at the list too much. So. Yeah. It's, it's, and you've just stacked this over time, just on project, on project, on project. Um, so how many business, like how many businesses are you currently sort of involved in at this time? Well, okay. Let's see. Uh, well, we have, there's one business. We have Layback, Trust Bag, Suprella, um, and three new products coming out. And we're starting with CBD oil as well. Um, I have, yeah, then I have uh, um, a new cosmetic uh, discovery from Germany that we're bringing to America. It's already sold licenses in, 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 in Russia. Sauerkraut. And... Sauerkraut face compacts. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly. it. I knew it. <laughs> Jesus, that's funny. Okay, so, um, and then we have, I have on Amazon.com, I have, uh, personally, I have uh, three products. And um, there's, I do my consulting, and I do my coaching, and I do my keynote speaking. Nice. And you have a family on top of this. Yeah, yeah, I have an amazing, and I always say, you know, beautifully hot Hungarian wife, uh, and two children, two and three years old. Um, and they're my rock, you know, they really are. I do what I do for them, you know. I yeah. live my life. I, I literally did everything I always wanted to do, and now I do it for them. I'm 50, you know. I got a two-year-old uh, 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 daughter and a three-year-old son, and my wife's 29. So, you know, I'm doing this for them, making their life solid, making it, you know, and I, and I love what I do. You know, I love what yeah. I do, I love being successful. And, and uh, success to me is not what I get for me. It's what I get for everybody else. Hmm. Now, that's, that, that's why I measure success. Intuition for me is such an interest to me. It's something that I've, I build into my, my conception of, of how to live a good life and how to, uh, how, to, how to work in business and everything. I'm very, very sort of intuition-based as well. What are, is this something that in the rest of your life, like are you, uh, how, do you how do you fuel your intuition is what I want to ask. How do, you, how do you make sure that you're, you're sort of continually coming back to, to that intuition? How are you expanding your intuition, expanding your, your consciousness? One of the things you said that I thought was really interesting was just that you knew early on that, you're, that the point of your life was to grow too, was to, that you had to grow. And so you had to get out of the military to grow in the way that you wanted to grow. And I think that's, that's something that not everyone uh, sees and not everyone thinks about. A lot of people think, or the, the, the traditional mindset was that you get your career and you, uh, you get your family and then you move to, you know, you move to that, that sort of old American nightmare, as you say, that you maybe grew up in, uh, the consequences of. But, but now, you know, especially in performance marketing, you've got these people who are living by their intuition, who are honestly, and, and also trying to grow themselves personally all the time. What are, what are some ways that you sort of fuel that, that interest? Look, there's, you know, there's different ways to do everything. Some people, it depends on your type. I mean, if you're, if you're like a brainiac or if you're like a C type that's really detail oriented you, and, or you're a, uh, you, you, you learn by listening and not by, by seeing, and there's different kinds of, there's audios, there's visuals. Everything for me is pictures, everything. So I, everything I see, I do, I think, I feel is in pictures. Um, when I, the way I feel my intuition, first of all, I have to be grounded and cleared. So purged, cleansed. And I cleanse myself through uh, certain ceremonies in certain countries. Sometimes we, I think we spoke about that uh, uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I'm going to Peru now, for instance, in August uh, for a 10-day retreat of Ayahuasca, San Pedro, and Ibota um, to do a complete cleansing and purging. I was in 
uh, in a monastery in, in Austria for a few months, uh, in a Benedictine monastery, uh, and spent the days meditating and just purging. And, and it, it sounds, you know, people are scared to do that in business uh, because they think, okay, if I do that, then people think I'm esoteric. Be who you are. You know, be who you are. You're, you're talking about what I, what, I, what I speak about in my, in my in most of my keynote speeches for business is, is simple. Honesty, integrity, and transparency. And people think, well, those are great business terms. No, I'm talking about with yourself. Mm. Be honest, transparent, and have the highest integrity with yourself. Never lie to yourself. Never say, like you said, some people don't realize they have to grow. That's, that's because when they hit that wall, they go, damn, I must be having a bad day. No, your intuition is trying to tell you something. Wake up. Look out there. There's so much more out there. It's not because you want more. It's because you personally can grow and help help others, help yourself, help your family. Everything around you is possibly that could be possibly touched by you and and grow and flourish. And it sounds so cheesy sometimes, but that's literally how I live. And if and you've met me, so you know I embody that completely. Yeah. So it's something that I I am I'm so passionate about helping others. And and I'm I'm actually coaching a guy on Twitter because that's the only account he has for some reason because his mother that's won't let him. Weird. 42 Ooh. characters at a time, 142 characters at a time. In the messages, in the messages. Okay. Uh, and he's from uh, central LA, and he's a 15-year-old uh, kid from, I guess, the ghetto, and he doesn't have any money, and he wants to be a comedian. Hmm. So I'm hooking him up how to do YouTube videos and use life as his stage so he doesn't have to buy anything and stand there like, a, you know, he thinks he's funny. So I said, do what you do every day and film. And then I critique and stuff. You know, it says, I'm doing that for free because I like the guy. I help all disabled veterans for free. I coach I kept, anyone who comes to me. Oh, now my coaching isn't easy because I, I'll tell you exactly what I think uh, um, you need to do in a way that I'm not telling you to do it, but in a way that opens you up. And some people aren't ready for that. So there's, there's all kinds of things to do. And, and, and I, I like to find it. And I don't ever say, oh, I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I delegate everything that I can. Yeah. Never. I, I always delegate the task as much as I can, but never the responsibility. I'm always checking. You know, so um, that's that's how I can do as much as I do without being burned out. I think that's a real. You were saying in a previous conversation that this is something that you brought into a consulting job you had with Apple, or you were actually working with Apple, and that became yeah. a sort of central tenant of, of their business after this. Right. Well, I was in. Uh, I was up, up for a position for uh, the German-speaking uh, Switzerland, Austria, and uh, Germany, and I went through I think fourteen interview, twelve or fourteen interviews. And at the end, then they, the whole team's there, this, the director of the world and whoever, you know, God of Apple and whoever they are. And uh, I was sitting there and they said, well, Stephen, you know, we're looking at your resume. We're looking at everything you do. And you're here in Switzerland and during the week. And then the weekend you're in, uh, in, 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 in Budapest and then sometimes you're in Germany. What, how is it possible that you can do all this? And that's what I said. Delegate the task, never the responsibility. And he went, write that down. <laughs> <laughs> and so that allows you to maintain the integrity aspect of what you of what you know of your credo and the uh, the transparency as well because you're you're sort of like staying on top of the high level of, of each of these tasks but not always the nitty gritty and that and that comes down to communication I guess with the people that you delegate to that you're always delegating the real spirit of what you're after and then I imagine there's a lot of leeway in how that gets executed by the people that you delegate to. It is because they they live the credo too as much as they can, and it's all about being authentic. If you're if you're honest and, and you're and, and you're transparent with yourself, and you keep your integrity at the highest levels, you're going to be an authentic person. And authenticity dictates your market value, and your market. Value, if people know you, oh, we got to go to Steve, the highest level of integrity you can find. And I was actually told that the other day, which surprised me because I didn't realize people use those words except for me. And you know, he 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 was like, look, Steve, I want you because you I don't know anyone with integrity higher than yours. You know, and well, thank you very much. And I, I take it as a compliment, but I don't do it for that. No. So when, when, when I go to a company and I start coaching them or doing training or something, we talk about that. Obviously, for a leader, it's paramount that he's transparent with himself and his team. If there's a decision needs to be made about the team, he better in, include that team. He's not a leader. He's a pusher. Right. So and then we have um, for the, and then I have for the business side of it, I have the simple PPS, which is people, procedures and structures. Now, if I can put a structure in place with the right people that I can delegate to and put structures in place that they need to follow, I have time to build my business, grow myself, and help others. And that's what I do. Very interesting. So that's. do you have any tips on people who are building a team or maybe they already have a team? What, what's, a, what's a great tip for people that, are, that, that have teams that really want to – um, have this sort of aspect of communication and transparency, transparency and integrity sort of go throughout their whole organization? 
it's funny you asked that. I just had that question uh, from a client, and she just got a new position in a new company at a very high level from, from where she was before. And she said, how should I go about building this team? And, you know, and I said, honesty, integrity, transparency, of course, which means a, a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and she said, and I said, always ask their opinion because you want them to know that you're taking it into account. If you're going to grow a team, you have to work together. That's why that's what team means. And she said, well, they won't respect me then because I'm asking for their help. I said, did, you, did I say ask for their help or ask for their opinion? There's a big difference. Mm. You know? So how people understand things and how they communicate, if I say, hey, guys, um, I got this problem and I, I really like your advice, that's nice, but it sounds like I'm unsecure mm. or I'm insecure and I'm, I'm unsecure. If I go, guys, this is a job. We have a challenge. And every single one of us have keys to fit into the keyholes, and we're going to make this happen together. What's your suggestion? What's your suggestion? How would you do it? What do you think? What do you think of their suggestion? Okay, great. And then if, if you actually have a great one, you go, you know what? What if we do that one? And if we, do you stand by it 100%? We'll go forward, but only if you stand by it 100%. So you, you're, you're, you're sort of helping them into the role that they want to be in, but they're probably not sure if they can yet. So you're not the guy who says, we're going to do it my way. I'm the leader. That, that, that's not a leader. That's, that's just, that's, that's a bully. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Hmm. So there's times for that, but yeah. I want to go back to what you touched on. I want to go back to ayahuasca for a minute. So this is something we haven't broached any of these really great topics in this podcast before. This is something that that, that I think that uh, our audience is is interested in. I think there's a lot of people who are interested in self improvement, and there's a lot of people who've become aware of what ayahuasca is. But can you just just do, give a little bit of a high level overview on what it is? Uh, and why why it's been an important part of your life. Okay, well, let me go through the process. For the first process I went through was self-help books, right? Then the videos and the DVDs. Back in the day, there were tape cassettes on your, on your Walkman with earphones and, you know, mantras and all this kind of stuff. Then I went to the mantras. Then I went to meditation and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it all has its place. It really does, you know. But most of it was logical. It was, it was not spiritual or, okay. let's say, it wasn't your soul. It was all, okay, I have to do, think about it. Create a habit, it takes 21 days. Break a habit, it takes 21 days. Train your brain, you know, this kind of stuff. It's all logic. Well, I want to get away from that because if, you, if we have saying, you know, when you play pool, if you think long, you think wrong. That's what, that, was our, that was our thing all the time. Just poke and shoot, you know, boom. Yeah. So I have a friend who used to be a McKinsey consultant in London making, you know, a lot of money. And he did ayahuasca one time in London and quit his job the next day and moved to the Amazon. With the, with, with the Shipibo Indians, went into the Amazon and did his, uh, you know, was there for a year or two learning and everything about how to cook the plant and other stuff. Went into the Amazon for his, pilgr his pilgrimage, which you have to do to become a shaman, two years alone in the Amazon. He did it. And he came out and now he travels the world and does ceremonies. Well, he did my first ceremony, actually my first six ceremonies. Uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you what happens. Um, you have to go in with an intent. So your intent must be, I want to clear this. I want to do this. I want to, you know, uh, solve these problems in my life. And you have to be open for anything that comes because you're purging. You're purging all the stress, all the blockages, all the bad energy, the baggage that you bring with you through life. It carry You carry it. Whether you know it or not, you're carrying the baggage. And if, uh, right now, anyone who's listening, sit back, close your eyes, and think about the last 10 years, what you went through. If you remember the bad things and the good things, hopefully you do, there's something there that you're keeping with you that you don't need and maybe could be holding you down. And everyone knows that they have like self-esteem or I don't have self-pride, uh, you know, I have money problems all the time. How can I fix this? And you shouldn't do it for, for um, you know, let's say practical reasons. You do it for spiritual clarity. And you come out of there, my friend, um, it's like a rocket to the moon. That You're the only one there. Yeah. You're the only yeah. one there, and the planet is yours, and it's so effortless. It's so effortless. So the first time I got out, I just I, – I created a whole new world for me again. I just said I'm going to do everything different. And from that point on, I did everything different again. And since then, I just, I just stack it and build it and things. And right now, it's actually – for me and actually through you, I, I have to say, is another big change that I'm – that I'm, that I'm, since – when was this? Four weeks ago that we met? Yeah. Uh, we actually 15, saw yeah. you before. Yeah. So it was four weeks ago that we went to the, to the, to the meeting. And since then I've had so much interaction with your industry, mm. or, that's our industry. And it's, it's really, I've had, I have two, two calls a day from people who were at the conference or 
heard about the conference and stuff, asking for ideas and advice. And I'm growing amazingly, and it's such so much fun. And I'm looking forward to sort of balancing this out when I go to uh, when I go to Peru next month. It'd be awesome. Yeah, and so this is a ceremony with not just ayahuasca, but also San Pedro and Iboga. Explain do you, what's what's the thinking like? The most I've this is it's really impressive to me because I've I've never done this myself. I've researched it quite a bit. It's something I'm interested in at some point. I'm a little afraid of it as well. But you've got you, you, three day ceremonies is what I've heard of. You're you're doing a ten day ceremony with, and is it is it actually doing it every doing one of these these uh, entheogens every day or is there break no, it's, periods? It, it's not. It's two, four, five, six days. Six days, okay. but still. So you, right? Yes. Well, yeah, it's a lot, but you still in between you walk to Machu Picchu and you go and do the cer- the healing ceremonies and the meditation with the Indians. So you're still in that trance. And Iboga lasts for three days anyway. Iboga lasts for three days anyway. So, you know, it's not just one day like it is, uh, or a half a day. Basically, you have the mother plant, that's ayahuasca. The father plant is San Pedro, and Iboga is the grandfather. Mm. Hopefully he's all... not too strict. Oh, well, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a kindly but grandfather. It depends on you. Yeah, depends I guess it does. I guess it does. I, I have a friend who is a lawyer, and he, he went uh, and did a ceremony, and he just came back saying, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. And he, it, it's sort of like, I think he fought it a lot. I think he, he ended up fighting it. And he's someone who I would honestly characterize as having a fair amount of like, uh, I don't know, self delusion. I, it's hard to, it's hard to say this particular person, but, and I, I wonder if you, if you got in that situation, you're not really ready to face it. I imagine it could be a pretty nightmarish experience if you're not ready to, to, to kind of give into it in a way. Let go. Let go. Yeah, completely let go. You have to, like that when you fall back into someone's arms, you, you hope they're there. That's what you're doing. You have to let go. People think, okay, I'm letting go, but I'm going to watch out what's going on. No, 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 no. Let go. Embrace everything that happens. You know, I've died almost every time that I was in that I did I was. And so, I know. just by Bring letting yourself go, and then and that's what allows you to be reborn. Rebirth, I mean, all the way. And it's, it's, I can't even explain it because it's so amazing. And, and what it does is it, fo- it allows me to focus back on the intuition and allows me to drive business, my life, my friends, my family, and just be that guy that everyone can count on and that's happy to be around and happy to be around people. People are happy to be around you. It's just fun and it's exciting and it's just a great life that mm. way. And it's not only – look, it's not only ayahuasca because you have, you have people that go and do that and they do the ayahuasca trips, but they're not ready, like you said, to let go and open up. You know, you have to open up your heart, open up your, your soul and be ready for that and embrace it. And when you come back out, you have to share it because it's everything you get, you have to share. That's what that's the cycle of life. Mm. If you keep it for you and say, yeah, I'm going to want to be the most powerful, you know, no, it's not going to work. You, know, you, you, you really it's, it's a fluid. It's a fluid thing. Yeah. Now you're saying you're saying that you know it's not always the thing you think you associate with businessmen and 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 talking about this kind of stuff. But do you think we're we're it's it's really opening up? Do you think? I bet our audience. I bet I, I'd be interested to see some comments on this video. But I bet a lot of people in our audience that that this these kinds of things are very much on their radar. I feel like we're in a bit of a period of of sort of we're, all, we're at the end of a disillusion illusionment where we're realizing that the the past ways of living aren't, aren't fulfilling necessarily, and that. Uh, there is this whole other like non-material component to existence. This is what I, you know one of the things that I'm interested in, and uh, and that we have to find we have to find a way to come to terms with it. We have to stop suppressing the fact that the universe is a little bit magical. You know, yeah. are you finding that? Are you are you feeling it that there's a bit of a movement happening around this? Totally. And what I'm finding is is the majority of the people are fighting it. That's where the aggression, the hate, the the, the separation, the division comes from. People are fighting it. They want to stick to what they know. Change is scary. Uh, that's called cognitive dissonance. Dissonance, you know, where you stop and you're like, I have to protect my values, my life, and what I believe. Otherwise, you know, what would what did I do? What I did for? Yeah. Um, good, uh, good, 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 good example of soldiers, police officers, those kind of guys that get paid to enforce the law. Now they're doing things that are questionable, but they still have to do it. Otherwise, they would crack. Yep. Because like, I'm actually a tool. I'm being used, or whatever. That's what happened to me in the army. I realized. Although I'm proud of it, and don't get me wrong, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I, that's that's the most formidable time of my life. I realized I was complete, you know, completely used. Of course, I'm a soldier. That's yeah. what happened. You don't realize that when you're young. So, um, was a question again? <laughs> <laughs> just just the movement, just the, the people oh, kind of opening up to, to to these kinds of things more and more. 
And it's funny you say that because look, the, the millennials and all that kind of, I don't, I, I don't tend to put people in these groups, you know, millennials and boom, boom, baby boomers and things like that. But what I realized this industry, what you're talking about now, this industry is not the, the cognitive dissonance kind of person. They're the person looking for that next sort of environment or that, 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 that hole they can fill or the void, the void. It's, it's, it's like, it's the marketing, I guess the marketing hit. You know, we got to find that new trick. We got to find that new curve. And I, the people that I talk to, and even even our guys in the office, and they've they've all done ayahuasca, every single one of them, hmm. every single one of them. And I'm, that's not even exaggerated, more than once, you know, and some Pedro. You know. So it's it, for me, it's it's a normal, normal day in my life where we talk about ayahuasca and the experiences we had, and and how sometimes you lean on it, yeah, you know, and. So, Sometimes you don't need it, but you know. I whatever. think it's I think it's essential, and I think uh, I I forget who I think this may have been Graham Hancock, uh, the fingerprints of the gods guy, uh, who who was talking about these old um, temples of initiation that they used to have in in sort of ancient Greek society, where people would go, where people on mass, all society members would go to these rites of initiation, and they would put themselves through either some sort of uh, drug experience like this or some sort of deprivation experience. But it's kind of like what what it would do for you as a, as a society would be you'd, you'd leave one of these ceremonies where you'd all had these sort of experiences that were unexplainable by by your traditional work a day life, uh, and then but you could look at someone in the eye and even though you can't always talk about and and put into words what you experienced you could look at someone and know that they went through the same thing and and it gives you a bond that slices through the, this crazy division that we see in the world today that where people are just drunk like just very clearly cut into camps and set against each other in this really terrible way. Uh, and it seems like something that, you know, Joe Rogan talks again about that. What he, what would you do with ISIS? He's like, I'd give them all mushrooms. He's like, I'd give, I'd get every one of them, subject them to a, to a mushroom trip and show them what, you know, or an ayahuasca trip and show them this other element of, of the way they're living their lives. And, and so it, it's interesting that, and it is being used more and more in medicine as well. All of these kinds of, uh, of, plants and drugs and things like that are being used in, in all sorts of heat, like actual Western medicine at this point too. So I, I feel like it's only a matter of time. Well, it, look, two, 2% of the Amazon has been um, researched for the healing properties of plants, 2% of the plants in Amazon, but it accounts for 60% of the ingredients in the modern day medicine. So That's if you crazy. Imagine, we move up to 10%. What would that do? I mean, we haven't even touched it. And you know, what I, you, you, we go back to ayahuasca. What it does is when you meet somebody who's done it a couple times, you don't even have to ask because communication is effortless. We use half the words, maybe thir a third of the words that everyone else does because we just we're on that we're on that flow, and it makes working very. That's why working with these laybag and trust bag and the whole team there and the owners and the investors and stuff, we're all the same kind of people that way. We're all that sort of yeah okay I got you okay thumbs up that's it like yeah we get we get, okay good and I'll say hey we need to, yeah go ahead we trust you that's cool. Boom, that's it. No meetings to have meetings to discuss and that no. We sit down, what do you want? What do you want? What can we do it? We can see yeah, we can do it. Okay, let's do it. Boom. Love it. Love it. Okay, so to build a good team, you've got to have a massive ayahuasca ceremony. You get all your team members on the same wavelength. You communicate without Slack, without Skype, you just do it in your mind. I, I have I've had so many different uh, people tell me a different in, in ayahuasca and even mushroom experiences where where you, people are literally communicating with other people. Uh, it, it, like without speaking and not in the same room uh, and actually both of them can say, okay, yeah, we had that conversation. I remember this aspect of it and that's crazy. Uh, I, I, it never happened to me, but I've had communication with the guy in front of me that I thought I was talking to and I wasn't. I was, we were just talking to each other okay. um, in our minds um, and we actually had a conversation we both remember, but not in another room. Or anything. So um, interesting. So, but, but you're right, you know, and, and, I think I think when it comes back to make it to leading teams and forming a team, it's simple. It's all about creating co co cohesion, and, and creating cohesion is a common goal. So you need to have a common goal to work together. Everyone has to be part of that goal. There can't be one person that's just doing the paperwork. They got to be part of the solution, part of the mission to make it happen. And what I did is when I after my first ayahuasca ceremony, I took over a new company here in Hungary, which is where I met my wife, and she actually met me when I got came out of my my ayahuasca uh, ceremony. And I guess that's why we're still together. <laughs> You met me there and why you have to keep going back so you can keep being that amazing <laughs> blank slate exactly. person. Yeah. So, um, and, and I actually incorporated uh, into my daily meetings a little bit of spiritualism, a little bit of belief, a little bit of thinking outside the box. And I built on that every day, every week, every month until after, you know, a few years up until five years, we had a team that would meditate together. Mm. We had a team uh, 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 that would go out 
and talk to customers. Okay, we got guys. It's two o'clock. We have a meeting. This is what we're going to do today. You're going to go out to a customer and you can tell them how much you appreciate them, how much you love seeing them, and if there's anything you can do, you can do for them. Just let me know. And we're going to come back and talk about how they reacted. And they go out and they tell they go, my, it was amazing. They hugged me, and that, you know. And it's just that kind of thing that you do every single day to create that growth within your team. So they, you know, you're never going to be able to pay somebody enough to stay because someone else will pay them more yeah. and they'll go somewhere else. But they'll stay for learning and they'll stay for growth, and that's where you got. That's where you win. Very interesting. Uh, our, our audience has, uh, I'm, I'm sure, split between independent operators and people who are trying to grow teams. I'm obviously trying to grow a team with this training department here as we we move on things. So let's talk a little bit. Like we we plugged a little bit about Laybag and Trustbag and some of the other products. What did you think of Facebook Mastery Live, Stephen? Um, wow. First of all, the venue was awesome. I mean, I, I I know Berlin from before the wall, so I know that area. When I used to go in my uniform across to the east side and get, you know, one dollar was like, I don't know, fifteen euros at the time or fifteen D marks at the time, East Marks. And, you know, you give like fifty dollar tips to the waitress and stuff because it was so much monopoly money. And to see that transform now into into uh, the modern day world, it was even it was an old building, you know. Yeah. So it was the inside was modern, the outside was old, so it was that sort of kind of feeling. But what I noticed there was the hunger of the participants. Man, I, I've never seen, and I've never, never, and I mean that, seen a, such a large group of people who were so hungry for knowledge, and they weren't, what's the word? I look at that guy, or jealous, or, oh, who's this guy? They were like, oh, what do you do? Uh, what do yeah, you do? Yeah. Uh, they were collaborative. Got- they were, like, yeah. And that's rare. That's this guy. It's got to be something from this industry. I think, it's, I think it is, because you don't see that in other industries. You don't. I mean, not not even in like the classic network marketing industry where someone goes on stage and shows you there's a picture of me with my Bentley that I bought in cash and that kind of stuff, and that that motivates some people, but other people are like, eh, you know. Yeah. So I was I was surprised, honestly. Um, it's the first time I took part in something like that, and I was I felt like I sort of found a home, and I met people like me. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it was so cool, and especially that it was, it was the thing about the mastery. Uh, uh, you know your training class. It was the day after um, the conference. The, the conference, and I spoke at the conference too. And the conference was funny because you got to see everybody. You got to see everybody around, and people were talking to each other, hobnobbing, and communicating at, at night. They were all you know go out and partying and stuff. And then you brought in this focus aspect of it, you know, where okay, sit down and let's do this. And you saw the reactions of the people, and, and I'm still getting comments today on LinkedIn and Facebook and stuff. Um, so I, for me, it was probably, without trying to be partial, I think it was the most important part of the, the four days, was the actual training. Thank you. And yeah. It was a it was a magnificent thing to be a part of. This this uh, podcast is Friday today. This podcast is going out Saturday. Um, just to let everyone know who who sees this on Saturday, it'll be very uh, it'll be midway through the following week that we'll be selling the recordings to Facebook Mastery Live. Um, so we'll want to we'll have this out there, and, and and hopefully people who listen will be interested in, in picking that up because it was uh, it was just a, amazing the way it all came together, and uh, you know it was it was quiet like there was a lot of there was more laughter and more more applause than I've seen at some other types of events like this, but there was just a lot of like just dead quiet staring and taking notes and so many pictures being taken and uh, you know when we had Michael Yang up there doing his many chat thing I don't think I heard a peep throughout the whole thing and including most of the speakers who all have Facebook pages who are, who are taking in this this actual live training for, for how to create a chat bot on your messenger page like right. it was uh, mana from heaven so it was it was it, it was a lot of fun and uh, you know, like I said people who are are hungry uh, you can't you can't pay for that you can't yeah and that's kind of people if these people are on teams man I, I want them on my team yeah and it shows that we got the topic right too, right? Because people are crazy hungry yeah. for this power that uh, that Facebook al- allows you to have as an advertiser. You nailed it, and I was I was I was I was actually honored to be uh, invited because I'm not the classic, you know, uh, nuts and bolts guy. You know, mm. I'm really the overview kind of guy, and I talk about how, uh, you know, we talk about how you choose the right business, and I choose the right product, and things like that, and what makes you know that that's going to work and that won't, you know. And it's literally everyone knows it. Most people don't listen. But it's like back to the intuition again, where you know, yeah, it's going to go good. And if you have even a millisecond of doubt, don't even do it. Don't even do it. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're not, if you don't have 100% lack of doubt, then you're dragging something behind you that's going to slow you down. Hmm. 
Well, I think that's probably a good point to uh, to leave this off on. So if people in our audience want to get in touch with you, as so many already have, what do you recommend they do? Uh, probably Facebook is the best, or LinkedIn. Facebook, they have to use my whole name, Stephen Eugene Kuhn. Uh, so it's E-U-G-E-N-E-K-U-H-N-B as Stephen. So Stephen e. Eugene Kuhn, you can put it in the pod maybe, on the screen or whatever. Uh, Facebook or, like I said, uh, uh, Instagram, same thing. Nice. Or not Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn, 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 yeah. Facebook. That's where you know I, I get people writing me out of the blue from LinkedIn that I never even you know met before. They say, "Hey, can you come to Turkey and consult us for a day?" I'm like, "Okay, you know, cool. <laughs> I guess I something right, you know." I know. <laughs> and just quickly too, you have a trip to Egypt coming up. This is something that's very personally interesting to me. I'm very interested in sort of the ancient history of of, of Egypt and what was going on there. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about Egypt and what you're what you're excited to do there? Well, it's funny because off the back of the of World Affiliates Conference in Berlin, I got the Arab World Affiliates Conference who booked me to do almost the same speech uh, in uh, in Cairo, of all places. And um, it, for me, it's very exciting because I've always wanted to go to the pyramids, and actually had actually had I used to, I used to manage um, uh, part of Andrea Bocelli's uh, ensemble, okay. and there was two of guitarists course. that played. Yeah, well, as one does, yes, one and does. they play 432 hertz only. Now, 432 hertz is the vibration of nature. So every bird you hear, every water that you hear trickling, that's 432 hertz. Really? What that? Yes. I can tell you this. Go to a concert where they play 432 hertz. You're going to be close to tears because you're so calm and it's so serene. Hmm. Oh, but radio, FCC in America. 442 hertz so they make sure it's higher to create a little bit of it actually was found out by um adolf hitler that if you raise the frequency of nature a little bit it irritates people it makes them more um let's say agitated so that they follow rules better and so that they're easy to control and that kind of thing i know it Less sounds at like ease. It, they're not as as at ease maybe it does does it affect your intuition should i stop listening to the radio well it, look Get the app 432, 432. Look it up. Get the okay. app and you get all your music through 432 in your ears. It sounds softer and not so crystal clear, just a little bit, but it changes the way uh, your whole it it your all of your cells react. Okay, it's, it's a true thing. Look it up. 432 of the golden and, rule. It's called the golden rule. And this is something I know. Egyptians, there are temples built in in, in these ancient pyramids that don't have corners. For instance, they have no right angles because these they were building these rooms with frequency really strongly in mind right well Verdi the golden rule everyone's heard of Verdi the music musician that's the golden rule 432 and the Egyptians apparently uh, knew the vibration of nature which I have no doubt so we were going to go into the pyramid and play and record in 432 hertz they actually have the guitars built to 432 hertz they're classic guitars and that unfortunately fell through but my friend um the niece uh, is the producer and creator of Ancient Egypt, which is the best-selling DVD Magical set of Egypt. Uh, Mag Magical Egypt, yeah, of, of all time, best-selling DVD of all time. And now they do in part two. Um, Beyond this, they did Beyond the Secret, and that kind of stuff too. So I'm going to to Cairo. And it's funny because they said, "Well, what would you like?" And I said, "Well, you know, hotel and flight, that kind of stuff, and a, and a trip to the pyramids." And they said, "Okay." <laughs> Done. So, That's awesome. So anyone out there, if you haven't seen Magical Egypt. Again, I'm, I, you may have I may have talked about Joe Rogan a lot, but Joe Rogan talks a lot about this uh, series that I believe the original one you can watch on YouTube, or they it used to be. I don't know if it's still up there, but go search Magical Egypt on YouTube and and just sort of dive in a little bit to the way the minds of the people back then worked, and it's really really interesting for the light it sheds on the way our consciousness works now and what might be missing from from the way we think about the world now. Right. Super you know, it's funny, it's funny because. Um, um, Benice, the creator, the friend of mine, I don't know, 15 years now, and she went through the process of, of you know, Mag Magical Egypt 1 and 2. It must be 10, 15 years difference now. It must be 15 years ago that number one came out. It took that long to get people back and find a new path and expand on what they, because it was so comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And they actually went there and back and back. It was, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite stunning, actually. Nice. Right, so magicalegypt.com, check that out. Support John Anthony West and his team doing such amazing work there. Uh, anyway, I'm glad we had a little side note here back to Egypt. And maybe we'll have to do another podcast when you're back from there and you can get, do a full field reporting on, on your discoveries into the ancient harmonics. 
all over it. I'm also I'm also might be going to Israel now. Um, okay. uh, someone who was at the conference uh, asked for consulting, and I might do a branding work. I do branding workshops to peg uh, your communication, uh, how you want to say who you are. And uh, I'm, I'm probably going to Israel to do that, so I'm going to visit some sacred sites there as well. This is going to be an exciting year. So I got Egypt, I got Israel, yeah. I got Peru. We might, we might have to bring you out to Victoria to do some iStack training consulting. Come out to the island. Hey, don't tempt me. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> nice, man. Okay, great. Great chatting with you, and uh, we'll talk again soon. My wife's uh, looking at me right now going like this, like, I want to go. I yeah, go. yeah, time to go. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks again. Hey, thanks so much, Eric. You Bye. take care of yourself, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. Okay, bye-bye.